went to University of the West Indies, it was a huge place. They had 205 students total. Uh, so it was a small, very intimate atmosphere. And I must say, the six years I spent in medical school there were probably the happiest years of my life. There was a small number of us. And I studied medicine at the University of the West Indies. And after I graduated, I spent some time there. Then I went back to Barbados to work because it was always my intention to go back home uh, to work. The idea was if the country had paid for my education, I should go back to Barbados to work. Then I left Barbados, and in those days, we didn't have any postgraduate education in the Caribbean. So like many of my colleagues, I went off to London for my postgraduate education. I worked then for a, a gentleman who became very distinguished, uh, Lord Rosenheim. He became then president for the Royal College. I worked for him in London for a couple of years, and then came back to the Caribbean uh, to work in, in Jamaica, always with the intention of going back to Barbados, but this never happened. Uh, Lord Rosenheim, uh, he is one of the uh, people whom, to whom I would refer as a mentor. He always used to say, never worry about what you're going to do next. If you work hard and do a good job, it will become obvious what is the next stage. And I've always found this to be a very useful law to follow. Don't worry too much what you're going to do next. You do well what you're doing, and uh, the future will take care of itself. So then I, uh, I worked in the Caribbean for some time. I went to work with a, a, a person whom uh, the last man I called boss, uh, because he was the last person who really had the intellectual superiority and intellectual uh, say gifts that I admire tremendously. One of the most human persons I've ever known. His name was John Waterloo. As the only person who's, uh, you see his picture somewhere here in my office, John Waterloo. Uh, he was a remarkable, I worked for him for eight years in his unit of uh, uh, tropical metabolism. I worked on various aspects of the physiology and biochemistry of uh, nutrition. I uh, did a lot of work on uh, the, bi the biochemistry of kidney function. Then I went back to the Department of Medicine and became professor of medicine and then head of the Department of Medicine. So then I left there and came to Pajo initially for one year. I'm the first of seven children and uh, my father was a school teacher, my mother was a homemaker and medicine, no, 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 definitely not at all. I was obviously the first of my family to go to university. None of my family had been to university before. Uh, my, my, my grandmother on my father's side, she was what would be known as a, she was a market woman. She used to go with her tray of onions and ground provisions into the market to sell them. And my grandfather, he used to cultivate his little plot of land. And my father was a school teacher, my mother's a homemaker. So I had to get a scholarship to go to high school, otherwise I would not have been able to go. Uh, so medicine, definitely not. <laughs> That was not in the dreams of any of my uh, parents. <laughs> It'd be wrong to say that uh, I was a little boy growing up. I wanted to be a doctor, and I used to look after sick animals. No, not, definitely not true. When I got a, a scholarship to, to, to come, go to university, it was a great debate, first of all, where I would go to university. And at that time, University of West Indies was very small. And uh, I decided I would go to Jamaica. Then I, when I was young, I was very nationalistic, you know. I used to th th remember that 1948, when our university was founded, was 100 years after the Communist Manifesto. And when we were in high school, we were very socialist-minded. So uh, very nationalistic, believed in uh, the future of the West Indies uh, as a nation, et cetera, et cetera. So I opted to go to Jamaica to university. And my parish priest was furious. He said, this boy could go to London, he could go to Canada, he could go anywhere in the world. He wants to go to Jamaica, he must be mad. And uh, I was a stubborn little fellow then. I said, no, I was going to go to Jamaica. So I went off to Jamaica to, to study medicine. Why I study medicine, I really am never quite sure. It has to be a combination of things. It has to be a combination of, when I was a little boy, Doctors were very, very, you know, figures of, of, of importance in the community, and you looked up to doctors. And one of the things, that doctors were economically well off 
in our community. So when, when, when you got a scholarship as a young boy, then the options available to you were, in those days, you either went into teaching, you went into law, or you went into medicine. Three things. All of them were regarded as kind of stable professions. My father always used to believe that uh, you went into those things, but you had to go into the public service. My father was a great believer in that. If uh, you were supported by public money, you should go into the public service after. And uh, I suppose that influenced my choice of medicine. The idea it was a stable profession. You could come back and be of service, etc., etc. It's hard to know when you're 18, 19, what really makes you do one thing or another. There used to be a PAHO advisory committee on medical research. And my boss, John Wattler, was the chair of that committee. So he invited me to be a member of that committee. And that committee in those days, when Dr. Horowitz was a director, was a very prestigious committee. It had Nobel Prize winners on it, like Little War from Argentina, uh, distinguished by a chemist on it, uh, uh, distinguished uh, microbiologist like Hernando Groth from Colombia. Hernando Groth spoke the most beautiful Spanish I have ever, ever heard in my life. Uh, very, uh, Guillermo Soberon from Mexico, very distinguished people. And most of the, the records were then kept in, the notes were written in English. So I wrote English reasonably well. So John Wattler made me secretary of that committee. So I was secretary for many, many, many years. I always remember, and Magali Hansen used to work then in that committee. And I always, yeah, that was a story I wouldn't tell. I tell the story how the first time I wrote these minutes, Magali Hansen corrected my English. I was furious. I said, who is this uh, Bolivian correcting my English? She was right, actually. <laughs> Anyhow, be that as it may, uh, I was secretary for a couple of years. Then I became president of the committee. And I was president of the committee for several years. I, 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 under, uh, initially under Horowitz, Dr. Horowitz. It, Dr. Horowitz paid a lot of attention to that committee. He was very keen on research, paid a lot of attention to that committee. And then after a couple of years, I was president. Then the person, there was a PAHO uh, research unit. And then when, I forgot his name, from Mexico, was the head of that unit, he left. So Dr. Cunha invited me to be a member, to, be, to come into that position. Because as president, we were always uh, criticizing the committee. He said, why don't you come now and be a member of the committee to be, to, be, to be head of research? I thought about it. So I said, I'll give it a try. And uh, I was telling that my family had a little family conference to determine whether to allow me to go or not. <laughs> because at that time, I was very comfortable in Jamaica, really. My department was doing very well. My research group was. I say modestly, one of the best in the world in its field. We had just built another, head, another section to the, our department, our postgraduate program was going well. And so we said, why do you want to leave? I said, that is the time to leave. As my boss, Rosa Heim, would say, it just came suddenly. This is the time to leave. Everything is going so well. You must never leave organizations and things are going badly. You must always leave them and things are going well. <laughs> So I decided to give it a try. So I came for one year, stayed for two, and then Dr. Macedo uh, became director, and he appointed me to uh, another position. And working with him was really a great pleasure. He is very, very, very bright, very bright, very bright. And one person's one of the things I admire with him his openness to comment and criticism. He would say, "Look." If you don't disagree with me, you don't do me a favor. If you find something is wrong, you must disagree with me, otherwise you don't do me a favor. Of course, I'm not going to get up in public and say you're wrong. But if, in this, if you think something is wrong, you must tell me, otherwise you don't do me a favor. And he would entertain argument and discussion, which I liked tremendously. Uh, so we got on very, very well. I, I, I owe him a great debt, owe him a great debt. Always open, open the comment. Door is open. Uh, he would have no doubt in telling you that is foolishness, no doubt whatsoever. But on the other hand, if you thought something was wrong, he would entertain discussion about it. Uh, he was a great director, a great director. I think Dr. Macedo created the 
the, the, a team spirit in Power Hall, which is very, very important. Uh, the, of course, there be internal differences, but the spirit of the kind of esprit in Pajo under Dr. Macedo was really remarkable. And Dr. Macedo, and this is something that I always admired, he never criticized what went on before. Never. Never criticized what went on before. His view was always, what are we going to do now? Rather than saying, you know, it didn't go well, etc. No, he never did that. Never criticized what went on before. He, 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 he had a tremendous spirit. He also he had a lot of uh, people, oh, you know, history often brings together groups of people who when they come together, their personalities gel under leadership and they do well. And I think that's one, something that, uh, of, which, of which I admired him tremendously, to be able to get people together, entertain this debate and discussion, but then come up with policies which everyone, to which everyone would, ad would adhere. I think that was a, a great virtue uh, of, of Dr. Macedo's. And he had, I, I think, whether he would articulate it or not, the view that there are certain areas in which the organization can make an impact. Uh, and he was, again, the personalities that were there, you know, Elsa Moreno, Sierra de Quadras, Jose Teruel, uh, lots of people around him who bought into the vision he had of the organization leading certain areas of public health uh, to achieve certain specific goals. Uh, he had that characteristic, which I think is, is quite remarkable in a leader. I was happy in the organization. I was lucky in the organization. I had excellent collaborators. I had excellent support staff. I would say I've never had a bad secretary in the organization. And I used to say it in jest, uh, there are no bad secretaries, there are only bad bosses. <laughs> never had a bad secretary in the organization. I had excellent support staff, excellent collaboration. So I was happy in the organization. I think I had a good team uh, 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 around me. I am um, immensely proud that uh, the person who was assistant director is now director of the organization. Very proud of that. It, it is very, it, it is impossible to speak of one's own time and speak of achievements because one of the things that also uh, was always drilled into me from the time I was knee high, no one ever does anything worthwhile alone. Nobody, nobody ever does anything worthwhile alone. Unless you have the collaboration, cooperation, and the buy-in of groups of people, you'll get nothing done. You'll get nothing done. I'm part of, I think, I like to think that one of the things that uh, was positive of my term there was that there was uh, also a team spirit. Yeah, in a sense, carrying on a Macedo tradition, there was a team spirit in the organization that allowed us to do uh, a couple of things. If anyone leaves a job and say he's done everything, he's a fool and a liar. <laughs> because you never, if it were so, there'd be nothing left to be done. And that is never the truth. Uh, I think in, in, uh, my in my time in power, I emphasized two things. One, the issue of the Pan-American approach. I also was consumed with the idea that the Americas represent a unique group of nations, and together, they, I mean, there are few things they cannot do together. And one of the things I always reflected on, the idea and the ideal of the Pan-American approach is really not new. And I always cite in 1904, when an American Secretary of State, very famous American Secretary of State, Elie Root, Elie Root, in Argentina, made an impassioned plea for the Pan-American approach, what the Americas can do together. And I think one of the, I like to think one of the pluses of the Pan-American Health Organization is to be the agent to allow that Pan-Americanism to flourish in health. Perhaps it can flourish in other areas, but our job, our role, I think our success has been to allow that Pan-American spirit to uh, flourish in health. And for me, that was very important, to try to inculcate, to perpetuate, to, str to strengthen that idea, the ideal of the Pan-American approach, what the countries of the Americas can do together. Not only the big ones, not only the small ones, but all together. And I think some of the things that were achieved is a, were a reflection uh, of that. The other thing that consumed me also 
was the idea that we, we could be a region that was more equitable. The differences in the Americas have been no, notably uh, portrayed as being some of the greatest in the world. And one of the things that I used to harp on was this issue of equity. How could you improve equity in the Americas? And that was one of the reasons why I placed so much attention on the issue of information. Because I say, unless you can show where the differences are and what the differences are, you can't reduce them. And that is why the emphasis I placed a lot, so much emphasis on information, information, the need to have good information, the need to have good information systems, the need to have countries uh, stress uh, information in all sorts. I used to say that information is, a, is we will traffic, I remember well in my inauguration saying we will traffic in information in all its uh, dimensions, uh, public information, uh, inf programmatic information, information on what is upon the people, epidemiologic information, uh, information in terms of the published word. Uh, we, sp we, we, we focus a lot on information. And I, 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 like to, I would like to think this is one of the areas in which I was always very happy, the issue of information, because it, good information is important to the transparency of an organization. Good information is important for the image of the organization, how the organization is seen uh, by, its, by its publics, all of its publics. And good information is important if you're going to re reduce the inequities that uh, uh, exist in the Americas. So I was always happy in that, in that area, in that area, information. I wrote a note recently to the director congratulating her, her team on what is happening in terms of Malaria Day and how they have advanced so much in that, in that area. A tremendous example of countries working together. And that can only happen if there's information what is going on, information what is done. And don't forget, also feedback and information to people who have worked in the area to give them a sense of pride in what they have done as well. When I left Pajo, I was going to do four things. I was going to read without interruption. I was going to play with my grandchildren. I was going to look after my roses. I was going to cook. Those are the four things I said I would do. Then someone asked me then, how are these four things going? I said, my grandchildren are growing, but I still see them from time to time. We just spent uh, two weeks in the end of the year, all of the children and grandchildren together in one place, which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, the roses, year before last, they had more fungus than they've ever had before because I neglected them so badly, but I promised to do better this year. And I, 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 my wife allows me to cook from time to time. Read without interruption. I, I don't have enough time to read as I would like to. Uh, this is one, I still don't have enough time. Maybe I just have becoming more incompetent in my old age, but I, I still find myself short of time to do all the things I want to do. But I, I'm involved in myriads of activities. I'm um, Chancellor University of West Indies. I teach at the John Stop Bloomberg School of Public Health. I am chairman of a couple of non-profit organizations. There's an advisory board for the Institute of Public Health in Emory. I'm chair of that board. There's a, a non-profit think tank here in Washington, CIDEP. I'm chair of that board. I'm a member of the Population Reference Bureau, their, bo their board. All of these are non-profit organizations. Non organize I haven't found yet uh, uh, any way to make large sums of money. I never have. And I, 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 don't, I suppose I'm too late to find it now. <laughs> um, but I'm, I keep busy. I keep busy. I, keep, I come to office every day. And people ask me, why you do? I say, first of all, this happened. It's not because it is habit. It's because there is always something to do. All right? Uh, if I go through my calendar today, the, the a meeting today, the meeting at three o'clock, I have to advise someone. Yesterday there were two meetings because I'm going off next week to a symposium in Oxford on what is the role of tertiary education in the emerging market economies. I'm going to participate in that. And I was talking yesterday to the people from the World Bank who are involved in tertiary education then in mentoring a young man who is interested in global health. So uh, there, there, there are things that always keep me busy. CARFA has been a, a, a dream 
uh, for some of us for some time. Uh, and the idea and that there should be a Caribbean collective response to the Caribbean public health problems is really an idea whose time has come. And I have to give Dr. Rose's tremendous credit for putting the strength of the organization behind that. She has, without Paho's support, I don't think it would ever have really come about, honestly. Uh, but uh, having said that, there's also, let me go back further. First of all, the genesis of the idea. The idea is that there should be a, a Caribbean collective response to the Caribbean public health problems as well. Secondly, the idea that many of the institutions, the, the fact that many of the institutions in the Caribbean that were dealing with some of the public health problems of the Caribbean were not coordinated or collaborate, coordinated enough. So there's need for the coordinating and rationalization of some of these approaches to the public health problems. And third, there's a political timing. A lot of these things depend on the political timing. The idea that you can engage the heads of government uh, with the concept of a Caribbean collective response to uh, these public health problems. And there's some, uh, a couple of things influence that. Uh, one, the experience of the Caribbean in terms of uh, World Cup cricket, that they could establish a, a Caribbean system of surveillance at that time throughout the, uh, the whole area was something I said, hey, you know, these are some things, some of the things that we really can do together. But then having had the idea and having had the uh, sort of political acceptance of the usefulness of it, of the value of the idea, then came the actual hard work in putting the idea into practice. And here there are two aspects I think that are worth mentioning. One is the support of Dr. Roses and Paho and two, the really incredible hard work of Eddie Green, Dr. Edward Green, and being the point person for mobilizing much of the support within uh, CARICOM Secretariat uh, uh, for it. And the last has been, I think, the openness of the government of Trinidad and Tobago, because the government of Trinidad and Tobago is going to put up the building, they're providing the space, and the generosity of the government of Trinidad and Tobago in this has really been quite remarkable. I saw this thing that there are three major, uh, several major ingredients. One, the validity of the idea of the concept. Two, the making the concept operational. Uh, uh, and three, uh, two, making the concept operational. And really three, what have been the ingredients to the operational, operationalization of the concept uh, would be where I would, would look at it. It is now a legal entity. It is now a fact. And the thing is now how to make it work. That is how, uh, there's no doubt about the validity of the concept, no doubt the validity of the concept. So I think the stars are all aligned for a very successful CARFA. It's going to take continued work. It's going to take continued attention, continued energy, uh, continued support from without and within the Caribbean. But I don't have any doubt about the validity of the concept and the usefulness of a CARFA for the Caribbean. I have no doubt about it at all. When you look at the problems in public health that uh, affect the Caribbean, several years ago, the Caribbean heads of government uh, adopted the, 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 the phrase, uh, the health of the region is the wealth of the region. And I was fortunate enough to be head of a, a, com a commission that they established pointing out what are some of the big problems within the Caribbean. If you look at, there were, I point out there were three really. One, the issue of the chronic diseases, the non-communicable diseases. Two, the problem of HIV AIDS. And three, the sequelae of injuries and violence. If you look at all those big problems, you combine them, then with the necessity for providing information, what happens in those problems, providing templates for approaching those particular problems, you, all, that, that, all that has to be done collectively. And CAF is going to be the agent, I think, that uh, addresses this collective approach. Let me address this this way. One could have the focus at the global level, at the regional level, at the local level, and perhaps at the individual level, maybe the local level. Oh. Uh, at the global level, the thrust is the health of the world as a whole. And in that context, the main issue is, for me, how you reduce the inequities that exists between the peoples of the world. If you accept that 
as the major challenge for the world for now and the immediate and medium term future. That in health is a major global challenge. How, of course you will need to address some infectious diseases here. Of course you need to address some uh, non communicable diseases there. But the mega, the biggie, is really how you reduce these uh, unacceptable differences between the peoples of the world. If you accept that, the only way that can be done is if the nations of the world agree to address the problems of the world. And the only forum by, in which the nations of the world come together are through their organizations. So those people who serve in these organizations have a major role in getting the nations of the world to agree to solve the world's problems. They have a role in providing a forum at which the nations of the world can discuss these activities. Uh, having said that, I'm going to come back to this because the nations of the world, we have, start, we have begun to believe that the nations of the world and the governments of the world are one of the same, one of the same thing and they're not one of the same thing. The governments are only part of the nations, but the organizations we have at the moment are really the intergovernmental organizations, and they serve a platform, a, a, for, a forum, their first function of providing a forum for the governments to decide what to do and how to collaborate together to address these problems. And also they serve a very important function, what I call the socialization of governments. When governments come together, they tend to in the process of socialization, they tend to agree more on things that should be done if they try to do it individually their own capitals. So for in the organization, I'm de dealing from the point of view of a functionary in an organization. From the point of view of a functionary in an organization, one of the main uh, uh, issues is how to provide that kind of forum to allow for the governments to come together to agree and to discuss how they're going to, discuss, going to address the, those big problems, the means of which are, 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 are the inequity. But that has to be translated into national uh, problems. And I, I'm a firm believer that the complexity of the agencies is often a, a something that we make up ourselves. Or, 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 or the horror of the complexity is some things that we elevate often too much ourselves. I tell you why. Because I believe that national sovereignty should allow for the nations themselves to dictate how these various players come together. And what I think the main function of the functionaries of international organizations, intergovernmental organization, is to help the national government to put all these players together. One of the classic examples of that is in the polio program, when it was the interagency committees run by the government that dictated what was going to be done. Because sometimes we forget that what the various agencies and multiple players bring into a country is small potatoes compared to what the country itself does and spends. In money, in time, in the blood and sweat of its people, what they brought in is really small. So part of our job is to how do you strengthen the capacity of the government to bring these various players together, many of which are interested in the country, but also interested in their own survival by definition. So the part of the problem at the local level is to strengthen that local capacity to bring together the disparate players so that disparate players march to the drum of what the country wants. So I see it at the global level, the governments, uh, the nations, the governments, uh, facilitating their coming together, facilitating their addressing these problems of difference and inequity. I see it at, you know, same thing happens at the regional level, bringing to having the governments come together to facilitate addressing the problems at the regional level. At the local level, having the focus shift, have the focus shift to 
how you can strengthen that capacity of the government to bring these disparate players together. And if you ask what is the, 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 the hook that allows that to happen, what is the lever for that to happen, it is the information. If governments don't have information of what each one is doing, if governments do not have accurate information about what needs to happen at their own level, there will be absolute chaos. Absolute chaos. I used to say in Paho that only three golden rules of cooperation. One is mutuality of interest. Two is specificity of purpose. And three is definition of resources. Three golden rules. And at the country level, it obtains. You have to have, and the only person that can guarantee that that interest, that mutuality of interest serves the people is the governments themselves.